Okay, I'll just back it up a little bit. Um, essentially, uh, to say that um, the way we can study um, this process of uh, synaptic plasticity uh, or long term potentiation um, um, is uh, using uh, um, model brain slices. Um, and um, when you activate synapses, so when there's a lot of activity that is uh, happening, that can actually potentiate uh, the strength of the synapse. And that's done uh, via NMDA receptors. They're absolutely required for this process. And that's what the figure on the lower right is showing is that if you block these receptors, you cannot get long-term potentiation of responses. And uh, so the way you can uh, think of this, this is an analogy that Graham likes to use, is that uh, the more often you go to the gym, the more you strengthen your muscle. Uh, same uh, applies for synapses. The more active they are, the more that they will potentiate. So I'm gonna skip that. Um, we've already heard a little bit about um, some of the properties of NMDA receptors, um, and they are quite unusual. Um, because not only do they require glutamate to bind, uh, but they, you also need to remove this magnesium blockade. Um, and so they are unique and uh, they're absolutely critical for controlling the strength of the synapse. Uh, synaptic plasticity is what we call it. Um, and you can Think of it as equivalent to learning or information storage. And um, the NMD receptor will also effectively control uh, how much communication is going across the synapse. So uh, the NMD receptor does need to be very tightly regulated. Oops. You can strengthen the synapses, and uh, that was the process of long-term potentiation that I was just discussing. And there's also a counterpart to that, which is called long-term depression or weakening of the synapses. And uh, normally, synapses operate within this range of uh, strength. What can happen is that um, if synapses uh, are not properly regulated, and that can be because of uh, NMDA receptors not working properly or uh, other uh, gene products not working properly, is that if uh, synapses are underactivated, for example, you can lose these synapses, and that can lead to disorders such as Alzheimer's disease and depression. The opposite can also happen when you overactivate synapses, that can lead to epilepsy or chronic pain. And uh, one of the uh, methods that, of course, uh, is important to to, uh, stop, uh, to to work on is finding new drugs and modulators that can control the NMDA receptor activity and put it back into this normal operating range. Um, we did hear about memantine, which is being used for uh, late stage Alzheimer's disease, and also ketamine, which is being used as a uh, antidepressant. So um, it's important to understand the way that NMDA receptors go wrong in disorders in order to properly target uh, therapies. And uh, now we're learning more about the detailed structure of the NMDA receptor and how variants can contribute to disease. Uh, this will be discussed in more detail by Dr. Furukawa. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Um, so far, we've not had any questions in the chat, so let's carry straight on to Dr. Furukawa. Thanks. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. 
Uh, sorry, I'm just gonna share screen now. Okay, so if you could see the screen, I'm gonna start my presentation. So thank you so much for having me in this Cure Green conference. Uh, my name is Hiro Furukawa, and our mission in my lab is to visualize NMDA receptors at atomic resolution. What I mean by atoms, uh, NMDA receptors are made out of amino acids, and amino acids are made out of atoms. So to visualize atoms, you can not only understand the shape of NMDA receptors, which looks like that in the arrow, okay, uh, but you could also help develop therapeutic compounds. We could actually visualize compounds that are binding to NMDA receptors just like that. Again, this is all happening in the past 14 years in, in my professorship at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, which is right outside of New York City. Um, as John beautifully introduced, uh, brains are made out of neurons, as you know, billions of neurons, and, and then they basically exchange information at the specialized junction called synapses, where um, NMDA receptors encoded by green genes are located. And NMDA receptors are shaped like that. This is the representation. It's actually the actual uh, density or what we call the raw data for NMDA receptors. So it's the image of NMDA receptors at high resolution where we see gluon 1 and gluon 2b in magenta and green, dark green. And they are encoded by the green 1 gene and green 2b gene. Okay. And we also have what we call structures of green 2A or gluon 2A as, as well. All right, um, for that to happen, for so we call it, we call this methodology structural biology. So our aim is to, again, visualize NMDA receptors at high resolution. For that to happen, we have to figure out the way to mass produce NMDA receptors. And we're not using a natural source. We have green genes in the form of DNA, and we incorporate DNA, for example, green one and green two B DNA, we incorporate them into mammalian cell cultures instead of the brain and let the mammalian cell culture produce NMDA receptors. And we purify, extract and purify them and then apply a technology recently called um, cryo microscopy or electron microscopy. So we're using an electron microscopy technique to visualize those. And then we need to have a way to interpret structures. Yeah, sure. The, the first question then was about whether we can see anything around loss or gain of function manifesting directly in NMDA receptors. Does anyone want to have a go at that? Anyone want to have a go at that? Yeah, so certainly uh, um, we can uh, we can uh, record from uh, we can isolate NMDA receptor mediated currents and uh, establish whether uh, um, you know there's increased function. Um, we can also uh, run uh, long-term potentiation assays to um, you know as long as the receptors are there, we can we can establish whether uh, they're contributing more or less to um, the assay that we measure in, in brain slices. Um, so there are several ways. But so the, the, the structure of the NMD receptor itself is unchanged, but the function is different depending whether it's a gain or a loss of function variant affecting it. Would that be fair to say? I suspect you could probably have both situations. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, so, so, so the bottom line, and I'm really sorry about the um, technology, technical issues. Uh, I was supposed to have movies here, but, but the bottom line is that 
uh, we can now mass produce NMDA receptors uh, recombinantly. So it could be a wild type regular NMDA receptors or the mutated NMDA receptor variant. So we could just mass produce them and visualize them under microscope. Uh, the type of microscope we're talking about here is electron microscope. Okay. Uh, so what we end up doing is to basically just purify NMDA receptors. And if you could see the screen, this is the representation of NMDA receptor images under a microscope. So you can see black dots. So those are NMDA receptor protein molecules in various orientations. So what we end up doing is to pick them up one by one. So we typically collect about million, I'm gonna call it particles, million NMDA receptor particles in random orientations and average those and you can start to see the features of NMDA receptors, okay, which looks like that. And then now we can reconstruct, we call it reconstruction, but we can just take an of random orientation of NMDA receptor particles and reconstruct them into three-dimensional structures. And we can attain atomic resolution. So we can see atom by atom structures, which looks like that. And also the key advantage is that NMDA receptors takes different shapes. We call them conformations. And conformation movements are extremely important. And again, sorry for the technical difficulties. The movie isn't working now. But, but the bottom line is that we can actually see the pattern of NMDA receptor molecules moving when it's activating and when it's inhibiting. Right. And the reason these structures are useful is because we can now model, oh, it's not working. Uh, anyhow, uh, so this is the structure of NMDA receptors. And what I wanted to show you in this movie slide was the location of green mutations so we can we have the blue you know blueprint for NMDA receptors. Okay, now uh, again we can visualize them at the atomic resolution. Uh, what it means is that we can now locate where the particular green mutations are within the context of the structure. For example, the mutation, the recent mutation that we've been working on, uh, which is methionine A12 to leucine. Uh, is located here. So we can actually pinpoint where the, where the residue of mut mutated site is. And what it allows us to do is to really figure out uh, what it does in terms of NMDA receptor movement uh, or basically function. So we can explain why this particular mutation is positive, positively, we call it potentiation, upregulating NMDA receptor activity. And we're basically just hoping to do that for every single mutation uh, that are available, that are that are happening, uh, and then hopefully we can come up with a way to regulate the um, kind of abnormal uh, way of moving NMDA receptors. Uh, the reason I'm saying that is that we can now also visualize compounds that are binding specifically to uh, each individual domains. Like for example, uh, if your mutation is, for example, located here, and it's, if it's affecting the area called ATD, then there is also a compound that binds to amino terminal domain. So we might be able to uh, regulate or fine tune the activity of NMDA receptors. So again, um, my apology for the technical difficulty. Uh, I'm, Gonna try to find a way to upload the movie file um, later on. But um, the take home message is that um, our mission is to visualize NMDA receptors at atomic resolution. And that would allow us to understand how green mutation uh, is affecting the function of normal NMDA receptors. And also, we can see the compound or a therapeutic compound. So that would also allow us to develop 
compound or novel compounds that specifically target the receptors that are problematic. So uh, with that, I like to also, uh, so this is my scientist at Cold Spring Harbor Lab, uh, people who are actually tackling NMDA receptor questions. Uh, some of the work that I presented now uh, was done by some alumni members uh, who basically just went out and doing the independent research. Uh, I wanted to also um, kind of mention about the funding, funding sources, uh, especially Austin's purpose, uh, which is now a part of uh, Cure Green Foundation. Uh, Austin is from Long Island, and this is the beautiful picture of Austin and his family, Paul and Awilda. Uh, Austin is now 17, and he has a green 2A uh, variant. And uh, it's been an honor to be uh, working with Austin for the past uh, six years, I believe. Um, um, and then um, just really happy that we're making some progress uh, to understand his mutation. Uh, and the structure uh, and the collaborators. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for that. I think you started to get the end of the end, but um, we, we, could, we could certainly see most of the NMD receptor cartoons. And that's fascinating to think how much depth we can get into now. And, and thank you and your team for all the work that you've done on this so far. Very exciting to imagine where we might go next. Um, the, we've got just a couple of quick, um, minutes left now before we're going to get cut off. Um, and there's there's one more question in the chat um, from somebody who would like to ask a question specifically about their child who is 10 months old and has a gain of function with epilepsy. Um, um, this um, question would like to um, ask whether there's any specific drug recommendations I appreciate that it's difficult to, you know, you're not going to be offering any clinical advice, but are there sort of the, what groups of drugs would be best to treat gain of function variants? So, I mean, if I could go, we, we definitely have to be careful, but if it's, if it's caused by activation, overactivation, if we know that the, this particular mutation is causing activation or, or overactivation, I think the best drug to, you know, for, for uh, uh, right now is to use memantine. Uh, there, there are many names for memantine. It's the basic name. Uh, depends on who makes it. Um, some company sells it as Nemanda. It was originally developed for Alzheimer's reagent. Okay, thank you very and much. And it is the blocker of NMD receptors. So, yes. Yes. I think um, there's going to be a lot more conversation at the next session after the break about gain of function and loss of function variants. So I'm sure anybody who's got uh, related questions should um, log back into that one, which hopefully won't have the same gremlins as we've had and, and, and be able to hear a lot more. Um, I think that's us. We've come to time. So I think we have to say goodbye very shortly. But thank you both very much for your presentations today and for the work that you and your teams continue to do on behalf of all of our green families around the world. Thank you very much.